welcome to How I Got Here, the inside stories of startups and innovation in travel and transportation with your hosts, FocusWire's Kevin May and Mozio's David Litwack. Hello and welcome to How I Got Here, Mosey and Focus Wire's weekly podcast about innovators in travel, transportation, and hospitality. Today we're joined by Sebastian Katz and David Armstrong, respectively the founder and current CEO of Holiday Pirates. Founded by Igor Simonov, Sim- Simonov and Sebastian Katz, Holiday Pirates came out of a travel blog that Igor started called Erlebspiraten that published travel deals he was tracking on the internet. In 2012, Igor and Sebastian teamed up to turn that blog into Holiday Pirates, a website that helps inspire travelers with great travel deals on social media. Thank you guys for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So we like to start every one of these the same way as you know, to ask you how you got here. Yeah, how I got here. Uh, For me, everything started back in 2009 when I came across uh, a pricing mistake for a flight fare from Germany to to New York. Uh, This was for only 150 euro return. And yeah, I ended up booking it with two friends, but uh, what we totally forgot about is that we also need a hotel and that it's maybe not so cheap in New York. So uh, yeah, we ended up booking a hostel, but we were not very happy about it. So we uh, agreed on this, this will be our backup plan and that we were looking for something else. Uh, So I researched a lot, I got into travel hacking, I read a lot in uh, frequent flyer forums, and then I managed to book us a hotel uh, right behind the Empire State Building, which opened just a few months before for the same amount of money what we have paid for for the hostel. And so we spent 10 days in New York for less than 500 euro each, including flights. And this was really an eye opener for me because I never thought that you can travel that far for this amount of money. And yeah, so I got a little bit addicted. I, t- uh, I checked uh, every day for flight fares, uh, hotel offers, um, just shared it with friends. At one point, I I started a blog by myself and to drive traffic to this blog, I also posted on other websites uh, like My Deals, the biggest uh, German shopping community. And at one point I saw that one of my competitors, which was my uh, co-founder, Igor, uh, teamed up with this website, My Deals. And uh, so I got a little bit jealous. So I decided to uh, spam even more of my deals on this website. So that they maybe uh, will contact me to join the team. And uh, this is exactly what happened. And so Igor wrote me a message that we should uh, maybe meet in Berlin. Um, So I drove to Berlin uh, within the next days, met uh, Fabian Spielberger, the founder of uh, Pepper.com, the biggest shopping community in the world, which includes my deals and also Hot UK deals and stuff like that, and Igor. And yeah, it was it was a fit. I decided right away that I, I really want to do it. I really want to take the opportunity and um, that I will join the team right after I'm finished with my studies, which was uh, within the next weeks. So yeah, we I moved to to, to Berlin um, and uh, Igor started blogging on the German website. I blogged on the UK website um, and we were uh, able to really acquire a lot of traffic organically uh, from social media, especially Facebook. And uh, the websites grew in terms of traffic. We had to hire more people. And at one point, uh, yeah, we had to just be honest to ourselves that uh, we, we don't have any experience in the travel industry. And we also don't have any experience in um, managing people. And we don't have that much time anymore for what we really love is to uh, to block and find us travel deals and to, um, yeah, to develop this company. Uh, so we decided on hiring someone who has this experience um, and so we, we we found David who then uh, joined us in 2014 uh, as a CEO and later got also our CEO in 2016 yeah yeah that's it <laughs> that's where I come into place yeah um, so that's how I got there um, well there was a bit of a uh, a story b- before but um, I had some um you know a lot of experience in the travel industry and traditional businesses to operating otas um up to then and um <clears throat> back then i had been managing businesses in switzerland for for three three and a half years and was um going to head back to to germany and was on on the, the outlook for for something new and i had two or three possibilities 
um, two of which would have been the, um, you know, doing more or less the, the same stuff I had been doing, going into, into businesses and normally uh, being on, in a, in a bad shape uh, or not the ideal shape and to, to um, rearrange things and, 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 you know, make, make them fit for growth um, or do something totally new. And uh, I was approached by, by, uh, by a headhunter actually by, back then uh, that uh, Igor and Sebastian had, had um, uh, hired to, to find someone and honestly, I'd never heard of Urlaubspiraten, uh, the, the German website, uh, to that point. And I said, honestly, are you looking for me? Um, is uh, um, it's, It was a business of, I think, not even 20 people back then uh, in, in a Berlin office, a typical Berlin office. Uh, people that know, know Berlin uh, might understand what I mean. And... Uh, and I had been managing businesses with, you know, several hundred people. And so it didn't feel like, you know, something that would actually attract me. Um, and I first then declined. And then after a couple of weeks, the headhunter approached me again, said, come on, just meet them, fly to Berlin and have a talk. I said, okay, why, why not? Um, and <clears throat> I flew actually three or four times and until we then, uh, um, you know, came to terms, um, but I was quite instantly, yeah, attracted and also convinced by the approach that they um, chose and were trying to build this, um, using the power of social media to to um, acquire traffic and to generate uh, revenue. Actually, because that hasn't happened. Uh, no, no one had done that so far. And so <clears throat> having built myself and managed uh, OTAs, I knew that you at some point always enter, you always find yourself in this vicious circle of, um, you know, trying to acquire traffic um, by either search engine marketing pay, paid on Google or paid on meta search and so on. And every, everyone's doing the same. Um, thing, um, no one really stands out there, and uh, this seemed to be a, a really good way of breaking through this vicious circle and becoming a bit more independent um, and um, un unreliant on uh, on Google uh, and and Meta Search. So yeah, that's uh, that's how I got there initially. Okay, thank you, David, and thank you, uh, Sebastian. We'll start with you, Sebastian, if we can. Now, um, you know, the turn of the decade, so 2009, 2010, 2011, there were lots of travel bloggers out there who were desperately trying to monetize what they did. And, you know, you are one of very few, I would say, that has managed to monetize what they do from a blogging perspective and then really take it to the next level. So what was, can you talk us through, if you can, Sebastian, what was the thinking behind wanting it to become a fairly sizable, successful company rather than, I say, just to travel bloggers blogging and putting in affiliate links to deals and things like that? Very, very different process. Yeah, sure. Uh, I have to admit, uh, in the beginning, when I had my own blog, I didn't even knew about affiliate marketing, and I didn't even knew that I could earn any money with that. Well, okay, I thought, okay, maybe I can implement some banner and people would click on it, and that's it. I never heard about affiliate marketing and that OTAs would pay you money if you drive traffic to their website and it's converted into, into bookings. But uh, I think what, what we did different then is that uh, the blogs I read, the travel blogs I read, they, they were not focused on travel deals. They were more focused on inspiration and uh, they wrote about uh, their holidays or the vacations uh, they did and why you should travel there. And they were not looking uh, for, for good deals to go there. So as I said, uh, uh, I didn't know that you can travel for, for uh, uh, this money that far. And um, 
And as I said, it was, it, I didn't know that I can earn, earn money with that. Uh, this is, was also not my intention. I, I really just love the, the idea that uh, I can show people that they can travel to certain destinations for that amount of money where they thought they could never travel because they don't earn that amount of money or, or whatsoever. And uh, then it, we just it just got successful because uh, people just loved our content and they love to share it on social media. And this is how we got the organic uh, organic traffic for free, because if you see flights from Germany to Brazil uh, for less than 100 euro, uh, maybe it's nothing for you, but uh, I bet you know some of your friends who, who would love to know about this offer. And uh, this is what happened. There are other sites that have kind of a kind of similar. And uh, the one I always think of when you when when you consider deals publishing and large subscribers and different ways of getting traffic acquisition is is travel zoo um would would you say that travel zoo was an inspiration in part because by the time you started coming along they were a a, a fairly successful business and had designs on coming to europe and things like that or was that something that was not even part of your thinking uh, to be honest, it was not even part of my thinking because I didn't know this website. Um, and right. um, now no, I know it for sure. But uh, yeah, yeah back, back then it was just about newsletters. And uh, we uh, found a new way in promoting those those deals. And we, we, we shared them on, on, on social media, uh, on Facebook. And um, I don't know if Travis Zoo did this back then. But but we did it, and it was really really successful uh, because a newsletter you just get it in your in your inbox, and maybe you will read it. But on on Facebook, uh, you see your friends re recommending those deals to you. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, just just to, to add on on that, um, because I think that's a very important part um, to to understand the success story, and you know from the ret retrospective is because Sebastian and, and Igor being, um, you know, in the middle of the millennial scope of uh, a demograph demographic, um, they really <clears throat> normally don't know those legacy brands. And I would, you know, um, really uh, see Travelzoo as a legacy brand in that respect because they are a, a email company. And uh, looking at the demographic of, you know, millennials and Gen Z even more so, um, you know, they, they just don't subscribe to, to emails, you know, they do if, if they have to, for some reason, but do they read emails um, frequently? Actually, they don't uh, that, that yeah. much. So um, <clears throat> my, and, and me being, you know, slightly older um, uh, than, uh, than Sebastian, and actually it's 15, respectively 17 years, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, of course, I knew Travel Zoo at that point. And of course, you know, me and, and uh, friends and family uh, that are a similar age, you know, they had subscribed for Travel Zoo and they knew Travel Zoo, but um, the generation that, that um, followed um, just didn't, uh, you know, get accustomed to that brand because uh, it's not broadcasting on the channels that this, de this demographics really use. Mm -hmm. It's a... Uh Sebastian, uh, back to you again, if I can. I mean, there's the writing, there's the you know the blogging part of it, and there's the publishing part of it. But you were also having to find those deals. So how did you um, work with providers of those deals, whether they be airlines, tour operators, travel agents, or OTAs? How did you start sourcing those those deals and turning them into deals that they would let you publish? Yeah, sure. Everything started, as you said, as a blog. And so we just uh, signed our website up for different affiliate networks. Mm -hmm. And then we were looking for those deals by ourselves. So it was everything manual. And it's uh, up until today, it's still a lot of manual research. Uh, we, we used flight searches like the uh, metrics from which now Google is uh, ETR metrics to just uh, try every crazy combination of airports <laughs> to see what happens to the to the to the price. Uh, so we found some error fares, so pricing mistakes, and then we combined uh, for holiday packages, which is a very 
but popular and important for the German market. Uh, we, we found out that there are some operators who have uh, very nice vouchers. And if you combine them with uh, some very nice uh, packages, then you could travel one week Mallorca for less than 20 euro. So uh, we got a lot of traffic with those offers. And um, of course, then we when, then we got bigger and then we uh, also contacted those brands and made like negotiations for better commissions or right. to, help, to help them to find good deals in their inventory because we always had a different understanding of what a good offer is uh, and um, so yeah so we had to speak with them of course yeah did you get any resistance from any of those travel companies in that very early phase because you were obviously starting to do well and they may have not wanted you as a distribution channel for themselves they would rather have kept their own direct channel or through their maybe say more official distribution uh, partners it's it's hard to remember something like this, but I, I can imagine that they, of course, didn't understand how we get our traffic and this mm -hmm. that we can forward those traffic to other websites. Um, but most of the times, uh, we just convince them to try it with us and um, then they they went, were convinced but of course airlines were not happy when we published those uh, pricing mistakes um, right and uh, I know for sure that a lot of airlines uh, have installed our apps and newsletters and we're checking our website for for those uh, mistakes to fix them as soon as possible and yeah I, i'm sure we also help them to improve their systems <laughs> yeah so you, you said something interesting there you said you mentioned uh david one of the things that attracted you to to joining was that it, it was maybe kind of stopping this uh travel traffic acquisition um you know uh, the bane of all of our existence in the in the the online world, um, and you know, uh, one of the most commonly cited stats is exactly what you said: how much exact uh, Expedia and Booking.com spend on Google AdWords to acquire their customers and then reacquire their customers and then reacquire them yet again. And I think kind of the holy grail of uh, you know a lot of um, kind of you know a lot of these guys is they're trying to figure out how to go up the funnel, how to how to you know get more consistent traffic, and then also how to um, own their own acquisition channels, like how do you guys think about this you mentioned travel inspiration you also mentioned um you know kind of you know reaching people through social media like are are you guys you know for for lack of a better you know phrase here are you guys just like building up a huge social media presence and that's that's kind of the like the the gist of it what, what were usually emails it's now social media and is it your secret sauce and how you then monetize that traffic or is it that following in the first place is it the 10 million you know facebook followers or is it a little bit of both i think there are there are different ingredients it's it's not that it's not as, just as easy as saying okay i have an audience and we just push out travel deals like with a kalashnikov and and then see what happens um that doesn't that that's not how things work um things work people follow you on social or subscribe to uh, to you know, direct messaging or or download your mobile app um, if they are really interested in in travel deals, but also interested in you know the inspirational part that we um, provide by um, you know showing inspiring places to travel to, writing content around what's nice there, why should you travel there, and things like that. So it's a combination of both. It's it's not just um, you know taking content from random APIs and 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 things from Rack and pushing them out on social. That's not how how it works. That's not an authentic approach to your audience. They they want to be entertained, and so that's what we put a lot of effort into. Is yes building the audience and growing it on on all those channels <clears throat> on different social media channels of course um sebastian mentioned it started with facebook of course we we uh, are successful on instagram we all we tapped into TikTok recently and things like that and uh you know mobile app is of course a super important thing you have to entertain your users and and that's where at some point um, people really follow the brand and then are also happy to to share great content with friends and family 
because they they really like it themselves um, because it's normally something they they wouldn't find anywhere else just just interestingly david i mean my my daughter is 16 and when i mention facebook or twitter or maybe even instagram now she kind of like recoils in horror they're just old people's social networks you know she's into tiktok which you referenced and snapchat and probably many others that she doesn't even tell us about is that a, a you know almost a a, a problem trying to keep up with what is the next network and how you can exploit it for what you're trying to do from a customer acquisition perspective. No, th yeah, th those are opportunities, and that, that's what that's that's a challenge, an opportunity. But we see it as an opportunity. So we we also, of course, um, <clears throat> started with Snapchat at some point, um, even with Pinterest and so on, and and especially Snapchat and, and, and Pinterest. When we, we started early with them, you know, three three years ago or so, mm -hmm. um, then they they seem to have a you know a bump in their in their growth, and so we uh, we drop things, and now they're they're seeing a revival, especially Snapchat, yeah, um, for for Gen Z, and uh, and that's the normal thing, you know. So you'll you'll have the at some point you we will see the gentrification of of Instagram, <laughs> uh, just as we've seen on on Facebook. And um, we, we have to be um, <clears throat> flexible and, and open to, to all these new channels. And we, you know, we work with them and we tap into them as soon as we feel that there's an opportunity and it's worthwhile doing so. Because we don't want to end up um, being the guys that haven't managed to, um, to you know, change, change and, and be ready for the future. Because you know the uh, the Gen Z of today are the are the the heavy travelers of tomorrow, yeah. and so and and that's also why I think traditional brands and travel companies um, are a bit reluctant to or even you know troubled by tapping into those um, those new channels because. You don't see an immediate ROI. You know, it's you have to invest, and yeah. that's what we had to do. And that's what Igor and Sebastian did in the beginning as well. You know, they invested heavily also in building this uh, audience on Facebook, and the monetization was super small. You know, but they they build an audience, and then um, at some point we were able to to you know uh, boost monetization. Um, and but you have to invest, and so if you look at a at a short term or immediate ROI, um, it, it's a challenge for businesses and maybe you know some managers managing budgets to uh, justify um, investing in a certain channel. So it has to be a strategic decision uh, to build something, and you have to really be able to to invest heavily. To make a difference later on. Yeah. So what I find kind of interesting about what you guys are doing is that so seven or eight years ago, there was a whole spate of travel inspiration startups that were kind of trying to create new platforms for, for this. And I've noticed this recently. Um, there's like those companies are all, you know, extinct now. And anyone doing this has embraced it, uh, what I think is a smart you know, strategy, which is that you're not going to duplicate Instagram or, or TikTok or something like that. So you know, tap into those platforms as it's just a different form of customer acquisition. Um, I'm curious how you guys then like think about your business because like as what your secret sauce is a business, because then I've seen a lot of pitches recently um, for we're creating a travel club for uh, matching up, you know, locals and, and great deals with, you know, our subscribers and stuff like that. And I'm kind of like, but like, but, but how, like, but why, <laughs> like, what, what, well, like, why can't, why are you doing this in a way that someone else uh, can't? Is it that you guys have invested in building the entire social, like the huge following on those acquisition channels? Is there some secret sauce between how you take the 10 million Facebook or TikTok followers or whatever and then convert them into deals? Um, or is it just that like you guys are the ones to, to make, have made it work? Like quite literally, like, you know, there were 
probably 300 other travel blogs out there, but you guys just were the smarter ones, like who, who managed to make it into a real business. Is it that simple or is there some other secret sauce there kind of in between that? Well, I think, so. I think it's important to firstly understand that Igor and Sebastian didn't really intend to build a, a huge business. So as Sebastian mentioned, they, they just, you know, did what they like to do and, and, you know, it was fun. And then they said, okay, maybe we can, can earn a bit of money, but it wasn't, it wasn't serious. It wasn't a serious business approach with a, with a pitch deck and showing a, um, a hockey stick development uh, and, and, and funding um, actually to date we're we're still, we haven't taken any uh, external funds. So we're, Totally bootstrap, no, no um, VC PE money in the business at all. Um, so I think that's important to understand that the guys were able to, in the beginning, then just realize and figure out, you know, what works, what doesn't work, and from there, I think the, you know, the secret sauce that you're referring to, I think, has been and still is. The authenticity of 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 the brand, the, the approach, the the tone of voice, the way we we um, approach um, finding deals, um, you know, showing them. It's it's not like we're trying to sell people something. Um, it's not a pushy sales approach that we that we use. It's it's uh, it's more like, hey, we found something. Have a look if you're interested. Look at it. If you're not, you know, don't worry. Um, it's 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 different. It's not us selling something. It's us saying, "Hey, we found something great. If you're interested, have a look." Mm -hmm. And so that that's maybe what makes the difference to to um, to others. Yeah. That's that's interesting. I, I've had a couple of conversations with a couple of those companies recently that I referred to, and some of them said, "Oh, it's brand. It's brand. It's brand." And you said it's you know authentic brand on your side and. Um, something one of them brought up was a way, you know, luggage company was really a brand play around kind of understanding that there was this gap between, you know, maybe super utilitarian Samsonite, super luxury Louis Vuitton or something that they could kind of slide in there. And it sounds like kind of like you're saying something similar in that um, maybe there's a um, need for a brand that is almost an impartial, you know, kind of um, the ones showing the airline deals that they don't want you to see. I think of, uh, I think of Skip Lagged as the OTA that tried to do that, but kind of like, you know, like got their legs cut off from under them a little bit. And um, it's almost kind of like, you know, frankly, your, 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 your brand has pirate in it. Like you're kind of like, you know, the guys who are, you know, the privateers, the for, you know, for hire and to be, you know, kind of ready to pillage Lufthansa for the sake of the, the little guy. I mean, is that, am I nailing that? Is that the, the brand that you guys are kind of putting out there? Yeah. So our headquarters would have to be located in Nottingham, I, I suppose. So Robin Hood. Robin Hood, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, a bit, a, a bit so, I, I would, I would say. Um, yeah, it's a bit like that, but I think um, it, the, the brand and, and, and has also evolved becoming a, a really a, a source of inspiration. And I, I think we can, we're, we're quite pride of, proud of um, being able to really um, inspire people with, you know, with content, uh, destinations and so on. Um, and, you know, creating demand for, for something that might have, that wasn't there before. And so that's why, um, you know, all actually almost, you know, all large and global and also large local OTAs and tour operators and metas work with us, part, partnered up with us because they, they see that we, uh, that they even come and ask us to, uh, to promote things that they want to have promoted. And if they're good, um, if they pass our, our quality, uh, check then we do promote them and uh, and then we drive a lot of um, business for those partners so um and th that's what the, you know, the the power of our brand also has uh, managed to to become i want but, to add something I, I think every travel company out there says they have good deals and uh, i think our users just learned that they really can trust us that we really just publish these 
really, really good deals. And I think if you flew once to Brazil from Germany for 100 euro and it really worked out and it's, it wasn't scam, then you will never forget that. And you will always check on the website again to see what other deals are there. And you will tell all your friends to check this out because this is this is quite amazing. So why, why wouldn't you share that? Yeah, yeah. Well, so it's funny. Something this reminds me of is I was clued in about six months ago to the existence of these kind of websites, Scott's Cheap Flights and um, a Dollar Flight Club is another. And um, I hear Bedroom's another. And um, these guys, they charge five, ten dollars or something a month uh, for, for flight deals. And I was kind of shocked because my initial inclination is I think probably most people who work and travel on the tech side might go, oh, well, why haven't we solved this problem? Technically, why are there still glitches in the matrix, you could say, um, that, that provide this you know, ability to kind of afford these flights. But um, I'm there's kind of two questions here actually where we can go one i'm curious why are there still glitches in the matrix that you can find these deals and will they eventually you know leave but i'm also curious that like all these guys are doing the subscription model i was shocked at how lucrative some of these small little companies are they are paying the full salaries of their 20 person teams you know just off of these five dollar a month subscriptions they have a lot of signups and um, I'm curious, like, you know, TripAdvisor launched a subscription platform. A lot of these kind of like little mini travel clubs are popping out. How do you, you know, so I'll, I'll focus on the subscription part first and I might come back to the other part later. How do you guys think about subscriptions um, and everything, everything that people are putting out into the market right now? Yeah, I, to be honest, I was also surprised that this is uh, now uh, uh, a business model for a uh, business model for a lot of companies and it really works out. And uh, for example, for Scott Sheep's likes, I think he grew out of Reddit and he got his trust there from the community. And um, this is maybe more or less uh, the same story uh, we had on Facebook. We, we got the trust there. He got the trust on Reddit. And yeah, I'm not sure why people are willing to pay money uh, to get the information they could also get on other websites for free, but somehow it works. Maybe David wants to add something here. Yeah, I think we, we don't believe in subscription models. Um, you know, you, you can monetize on that as well. Um, I think um, it, it would be, you know, easy to, to um, initiate something like that also for our community and then maybe convert like 10 or 20% of your, your users or followers into, uh, into a subscription model for, um, uh, but I, I don't think that that's, um, that's uh, the, uh, the way that we think of, you know, inspiring people and, and creating viral content, if you're, you know, if, if it's uh, appropriate to, to uh, use the term viral nowadays. Um, but that's how we grew, you know, by um, creating great content, having people sharing, liking, um, word of mouth, so to speak, uh, in digital, uh, digital way. And um, so I don't, I don't think that's something that we would uh, pursue, no. If, if I can say that back to you, what's, what's funny is that I, um, I, I saw an analysis of one of my favorite newsletter writers, why he didn't charge subscription and instead became an ad-based thing. And he showed his growth trajectory, had he charged subscription, likely what it would have been, or his growth trajectory without it and how much money he could make off the audience compared it sounds like that's kind of what you're saying is you're saying that like you guys would be stunting your own growth and your growth is largely because of a large audience that would share content virally and if you start saying well we're only promoting that to five percent of the population um you're going to you know kind of kill the golden goose is that correct yeah yeah i think so because i guess if, if you if you have a you know any kind of business and at some point you you discover that it's hard for you to to grow in terms of revenue, then you look on, you look to, you know, how can I grow the revenue? Not necessarily the, the audience or the, the, the users and traffic, but how can I grow the revenue? And then, you know, that's a, that's a, a way to do that, definitely. But um, when that's accomplished, you know, what's the next thing? So what, what's, what's the vision, you know, after that to, for growth? I don't see that, so. Um, I have a related question then. I mean, and it's it's in two parts. The first part goes to you, Sebastian. I mean, how ambitious were you before David came in? And David, now you can ask, answer, how ambitious is the company now? And the reason why I asked is that you said that you'd never taken any VC money. 
has there been a temptation to do so because you could have mixed your customer acquisition by using some VC money to start, you know, buying keywords and all that kind of stuff, as well as your other model? Or would you say that your ambition is is still modest and you want to continue the way you've been doing it? So two parts, Sebastian first. It's hard to say how ambitious we were, but uh, let's say we were surprised how well it worked in the beginning. And uh, right. uh, it, it, we could everything afford just from the cash flow. We could hire people, we could uh, rent office space, uh, and we could also hire than than David. Uh, but of course, we 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 had to uh, we th- were thinking about to enter enter more markets. Uh, but yeah, we, we needed someone to to help us there. Um, as I said, we had no experience at all in managing people or uh, uh, leading a company. We were both just finished with our studies. And yeah, that's why we needed really help there. Yeah. And I, I think, well, when, when I talked to the guys back in 2014, when they were, were hiring, um, you know, the ambition was, you know, we, we they said we, we think it's 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 going to become a serious business and we need help that's what sebastian said and the ambition was to you know um tap into further geographies and, and you know other other markets and back then they they had you know of course built something in, in in germany and just started with the uk and i think also with you know initially with italy and, and poland and uh, what we did, you know, in the two years after that is um, spread out to, to um, in total, 10 markets. And that's where we are today. Um, the ambition was, there, there were no like set goals, like we want to reach this and, and, and that, grow, that, that amount of revenue and th- that size. It was just, we know, we know it can work in different markets. Let's try to, to, um, to conquer other markets and, and and grow the business. And that's what we did with the means that we, we had. And Sebastian mentioned that it was, uh, was a highly manual process. And to some extent, it still still is today. But what, what I see for the future, and this is what um, why we um, you know, haven't yet taken any external money. Um, and we, we looked into that possibility, actually, to, to be honest, when when we were um, thinking of, um, you know, entering the U.S. market um, in in late 2015, early 2016, we were looking into that possibility um, and thought, okay, that's a, you know, it's a huge market. Um, uh, you know, do we need additional funds to do so? So we were were talking to to the one or other investor and then decided not to do so. And uh, did it ourselves. Um, and the, the the most important reason is because we, we said we want to first, and that's what we're wor- working on, and have been working on, especially since last year, and use the pandemic situation to focus on that even more. Build a scalable tech solution um, that um, is you know worth uh, you know presenting and going out with. And uh, and uh, raising raising money if necessary uh, to to really take the business to the even next level that it is today. It, it's an interesting strategy that you've used when you say a scalable tech solution. But there are quite a large numbers of the website that are powered by Kayak, for example. Was that a strategic decision just because it was easy to white label kayak to power your flight search and your hotel search? And I think it's love holidays for the um, packages part. Was that the easy route or would you rather have, you know, created your, your own software to enable you to do those things and have full control over the whole process? Yeah. Don't, don't think of us as uh, as an OTA. So if we, yeah. you know, wanted to be an OTA, then we would have developed our own mm-hmm. um, technology, own uh, front-end technology, maybe back-end as well, and so on. That was never, never the the, the ambition. Uh, we 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 build a lead gen business actually. So we we have a we have audience on social media, direct messaging, and and our mobile app. Um, 
acquire traffic for our partners and, um, and you know, refer it to them. And that's how we monetize either, you know, CP, CPC, CPO, yeah. uh, and, and so on. And uh, that's our business. Uh, that's what we're good in. We're, we're good in building audiences, growing them, attracting people for, um, for looking at great travel deals and referring traffic to our partner partner systems. That's what we do. Um, embedding several white label solutions from Kayak and from others. Uh, uh, some are you know, global uh, things that we can um, <clears throat> use in every market. Some are local. Uh, you mentioned Love Holidays in the UK, for example, and we have other uh, uh, like lastminute.com you, you use in several countries as well. The, the uh, flood, the click and mix product that they have. Um, it's just another way, th those are more in-depth partnerships because having those white label solutions in our, in our navigation within our mobile app or website um, helps those partners and us to, to um, increase the conversion even because you don't refer out, you, you don't have a bounce rate, people stay within our ecosystem and uh, and you know we, we don't have a problem with showing you know the kayak brand and all these other brands because as I said um, we're not pretending to be uh, the the provider we're we're the we're the 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 part or we're the people that that really just you know enable things and and show things and and that's why it, that works for us the the tech solution that I'm referring to is. Is not um, the traditional, you know, pool business. So you, you have all this, you build great tech, and you know, either wait until people come to search for something, or pay Google a lot of money to, you know, fetch people to come when they are looking for something. Um, what I mean with tech solution is um, sourcing great deals, finding stuff that is great and publishing it, showing it to our users on all those channels. That's the tech that I'm talking about. Well, so what is, I'm actually curious what the tech you guys are building behind, like how, how are you sourcing these great deals via technology then I guess like, and, and that's actually, I think um, is kind of like a little bit, you know, maybe we can uh, wrap up here is like, you know, I, first part of that two part question I referred to earlier was like talking about like the glitch in the matrix, right? Like, I feel like, you know, a lot of these deals are Lufthansa screwed up. Like we're now going to publish, you know, a, a deal there, or um, there's a pricing mismanagement in some way. I feel like as people get more and more competent, those deals could theoretically go away. Now, I think there will always be glitches in the matrix as new content comes online, potentially. Um, you could now start, you know, there's a whole bunch of tours and activities providers that are new, new to the, you know, the internet. And then, you know, uh, I'm curious, and then everyone's going to run their own specials and deals and stuff like that. And then uh, how do you, I, I guess, how are you scalably finding those deals that if you don't want to be on the back end, like you say, you don't want to be an OTA, you're going to move up the funnel a little bit and focus your tech there. What it like, could you give us a little more details of what exactly you're building there? So the, the, the thing is finding deals that people might not be looking for. So, um, and, and it's not, you know, the, 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 I don't really uh, want to give the impression that our um, core business is promoting airfares or, 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 you know, uh, um, price mistakes. That's super, super small. That, that's how things started, but that's a super small uh, part of, of the business now. Now, what we find actually is it's better to understand saying, um, if we browse, you know, manually, but also with, with uh, tools that we built, if we go and browse uh, airfare, for example, um, we try to find um, uh, great, you know, outliers in, in, in pricing um, from, from anywhere to anywhere. Um, and, you know, those, th those, those, <clears throat> routes might not be frequented a lot or people are not really looking for them that much. But what we do is we, we pull those, those 
um, those golden nuggets out of, of, of the sand and say, hey, we found something great. Have a look. That, so and, and that's the difference. And that's what, that's what the, um, our business uh, does differently. That's a di totally different approach than normally in travel where you have a, you have, you know, um, a wide range of possibilities, all that, all the, the white labels we have and, you know, all the, the search tech that all the others have, but, you know, you wait until people look for something that they want to look for. You don't, you don't pull out things and say, Hey, we found something great. Have a look. Um, and so that, that's just the, the difference. And that's what technology to some extent does for us now and uh, will uh, do so even more in the, in the future. And especially on the part of then also promoting and pushing out to our audiences, targeting and all these things. Okay, so we're coming right up on time now. So it's uh, very unusual for us to have two guests from the same company. We normally just have the CEO or one of the founders. So we're going to use this situation to put you on the spot a little bit especially as one of you came in to run the company after the company had been founded. So Sebastian, I'll ask you first, if we can, and very quick answers here. When David came in, what was the most encouraging thing that you saw in him and what was um, the most nerve wracking thing you saw from him? Hard question. Uh... Yeah, I was very, very inspired by him because he had so much experience. He, he worked in so many tourist uh, uh, companies, uh, but uh, I, I really don't know uh, uh, what I should answer on the other uh, other uh, part of the question. I really don't have an answer for that. Uh, uh, I still work, I li really like to work with uh, David and uh, that's why he's still on board, I guess. And uh, uh, I hope he will stay much, much longer. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we'll ask David the same question because he's the boss. He can say whatever he likes to the second part. So what was the yeah, most encouraging, right. what was the most encouraging thing you saw when you came in, David? And what was the uh, least encouraging thing that you thought well, we really need to fix this. Well, the encour most encouraging thing was, you know, having this um, this opportunity to really um, join an early or early stage a startup. You know, it was uh, had been around for for two and a bit years, and and really rather small at that point. Not even twenty people. Um, you know having the, 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 the co-founders uh, searching deals and writing them and, and, and publishing them and so on. Um, and, you know, immediately understanding and seeing, you know, the value that I can, that I can bring and, and put into the business and on the table and also understanding um, and seeing clearly how I can or how we could then really scale things up to from 20 to 220 people pre-COVID, for example. Um, and the, the least encouraging, um, I guess, was um, uh, was uh, then when I came there, understanding, you know, how, how many um, things that you normally expect to find coming into a business um, and you, you, you take for granted like, um, I don't know, someone taking care of this and that, um, like, uh, you know, HR things or, uh, uh, you know, um, finance or, or things. They, the, the guys just had a, had a box, a shoe box, where they threw in all the invoices and, and receipts and then handed it into the, to the, to the tax uh, advisor's office once a month. So that, that was the state I found things. And it was, was, you know, was quite cool. But uh, I knew that there was some some things to do for me. We are audio only for the listeners that are tuning in. Uh, Sebastian was looking quite nervous as David started saying that last answer. So just as an FYI. No, that was great. Thank you very much. So uh, you've been listening to another episode of How I Got Here. Thank you so much to Sebastian and to David from Holiday Pirates for joining us this week. If you are a first time listener, you can subscribe to How I Got Here at all the usual places. That's Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, 
Amazon Alexa and all those kind of places. We're on almost all of the platforms. So come along, subscribe, give us a good review. We'd really appreciate it. So once again, on behalf of David and I, thank you very much uh, to Sebastian Katz and David Armstrong from Holiday Pirates. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the How I Got Here podcast. We'll be back next week with more inside stories behind startups and innovation in travel and transportation. Check mozio.com slash move for a complete write-up of the highlights of every podcast with translations into five languages. And get your daily dose of news on the digital travel economy by subscribing to the newsletter at focuswire.com. See you next week.